It's an interesting game, and you've read, you've been exposed to about a tenth of the rules in, in a very compressed way, right? So that even those have a lot of caveats. The whole game manual is probably 60 pages long if you just just the rules section. And there's two of them. If you add them up, there's two different game manuals. One is sort of like the general rules, and one is the game specific rules. So, uh, so it it is a lot, and they they've got to learn all of this stuff. Some of it repeats season over season, like general build guidelines. This is what you're allowed to put on the robot, that kind of thing. How long do you have to build the robot? Uh, you have, uh, so the, the, the time you have the, the rules and the time you have the game. You want to answer that? So, um, or, did you say how much time we have to build robots? Is that your question? From the time they give you the rules mm -hmm. you have the game. Well, so, uh, we're, um, we're allowed to build during the entire season and prove upon the robot, which lasts from about September till May, but we have competitions sprinkled throughout our season, so we want to have our robot ready by our first competition, which is around... Well, that was, that was, I don't think that's the answer that he was looking for. Uh, you asked between when you get the game rules and then you actually get to see the game. No, 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 no. How long do you have to work? Oh, okay, sorry. Never mind. I, because there is the, the gap there. You can't just build your robot until you get the rules. Yeah. So you get the rules, how long is it before the first game? A um, month or two, a month and a half. Wow. So Whoa. this year... Uh, that's like early yeah. scrimmages and things like that. It is a long season. So like the, the, the uh, regional championship, there's going to be like eight, no, there's 12 tournaments that happen to qualify for the regional championship. Regional, regional championships in, in, in February 2nd, the 23rd. We know I'm asking that. Uh, I was involved in the best contest uh -huh. for about eight years. Right. And that was a great six contest. weeks from the time, time you got the game room right. until the time you started the field. Yeah. Yes, it's very different. That's a little bit more like what FRC does, which is a bigger class of robots that uh, that also is a competition that goes on these days. Um, but this one is intentionally a very long season so that the teams get a chance to experience the engineering cycle in constant improvement, right? Uh, so what you see early in the season is completely different from how the robots end up at the end of the season. If you uh, Can you guys parse for a little bit? Uh, we weren't planning on doing... Uh, no. The Kraken back there, the one with the red parts on it. We can talk about that separately if you guys have Q&A uh, afterwards. Um, that robot is now illegal. It's 42 pounds and 8 ounces. Uh, but it, last year that weight rule wasn't in there. Uh, and that's the one that they took to Worlds. So, uh, and, it, and it started out looking very, very different early in the season. So it's a continuous a cycle of improvement. Well, that's not so did you wear that's like Kraken at some point? We released the Kraken. <laughs> so here's actually the progress of the robot from last season. Yeah. You don't have any sound? It does. It turned it off. Yeah. Okay. So you feel a little bit unhappy about that rule? I mean, after all, yeah. geez, well, there you are. How many people had over overweight, cool robots? Well, it, last year they didn't have the weight limit. Right. The weight limit's new this year. Right, okay. So but it's kind of like... The, usually all yeah. our robots are really heavy, so it's a little disappointing. The reason they did it is because a lander has to support the weight of four robots, right? It's very hard to find the materials to support it. Mm -hmm. We expect right most size. teams by the end of the season will want to all start out from the hanging position because there's just more points available. Right. And they're going to return to that position at the end of the match right. because that's where maximum points yeah. are. Yeah. If it's just a couple ounces, you can start drilling holes and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been known to happen. We're going to cut off part of the sun shield originally. Okay, so, so you saw the, that, that's the basics, the provides a framework for what they're building this season. Um, part of what they have to do is, uh, um, is present what their development is to panels of judges during these competitions. Uh, and that's what this team more specializes in more. So it's about building their presentation skills. And by having them here, uh, you are helping them out. We appreciate it. Uh, and, and they would appreciate your feedback when we get to uh, the end of our regular presentation. Mm -hmm. But first, we're going to give you a little bit of a flavor, a little bit more flavor of what Worlds is like. Um, I think we're missing some slides here, but go ahead. And yeah. okay. So. We're going to obviously talk to you about the world's experience first. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so there are actually two world's tournaments, which is kind of stupid, but one, <laughs> one's in Houston and one's in Detroit. For both Earths. Yeah, for both <laughs> Earths. <laughs> 41. Um, 
And so we go to Houston one, obviously, but it's three days long, four days long, really. And it's like a marathon to the finish line because the first day you have presentation, second, third day you have robot game, and every day you're up all night improving your robot, making it better, blah, blah, blah. But, Me and Justin did not sleep. Yeah. yeah. I think the average sleep between all of us was probably three to four hours. But And we were all dead by the end. But it's great. Yeah, it's also yeah. really fun. Like, we did have fun, as you can see. And we did really well that slide. I don't know if you can tell uh, in the upper right-hand corner of that slide, yeah. uh, the little dots in the background above the hats, that's the, that's the competition stand, or the viewer stand, so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty big competition. It's, I don't know if you had the slides I in, the, I, I in there that. about, so, there, so uh, there's about 5,500 teams that compete every year, <laughs> right? Um, of, of those, 128 made it to the World's Championship, um, and, uh, and there's only like five awards that they, that they give out for the, for the top teams. And then, and then they get ranked by how their competition play was as well. Um, and, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's bigger than people realize, right? Did you guys know that there are 5,500 teams in the, no. and this is, oh. <laughs> yeah, so it's all over the place and it's, uh, and it's worldwide. I mean, it is a world competition. We had yeah. teams yeah. from Israel there. We had teams yeah. from China. Uh, uh, Lebanon. 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 They had a cool flag. Yeah. What was really yeah. cool was we <laughs> met another team from Mexico with the same team number as us in a different competition. So yeah. 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 we thought that was really cool. Yeah. All right, so go ahead. Israel guy, pop over. So, yeah. So, so they took photos of every single robot. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> so these were all built not for this competition, but for the big, the big overweight one over there. Yeah. This is why they're more bigger. Yeah. And so we have photos to share with other teams if they want to sort of learn from what you know, what kind of teams went to world. Question. Um, all right. So you get to world. You know, you're walking around. You're seeing the new robots for the first time. I know a few of them you probably already competed against, but most of them are new. Did you gleam any ideas in that last few minutes there before they kept you up all night? Or so they have something called inspection. And yeah. through inspection, you can't finalize your, you can't change your robot after inspection. Okay. So technically, you can't steal ideas at Worlds. Okay. And even if you can, it's very difficult. The staying up all night. It, it would be track. a really bad idea to try and change stuff that last yeah. minute. In fact, what yeah. we what we aspire to is even things like a code freeze by the time we get to competition. Right. Of course, we're not actually at the point where we can <laughs> can actually follow through on that, but that's what you'd hope to have. Like and building some, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What you do is you say, could we have a code freeze the week before, and then just thaws throughout the rest right. of the week. Right. <laughs> but the robots Find have, out what's wrong. The robots at that level are amazing, and it's really hard to copy off them. Like, I, I got there, and I was so scared, because you know, Every single robot I saw was better than ours, <laughs> and even though you want to, you, you can't because like the level of intricacy and detail that these teams have done so far, you can't really copy in one or two nights. Yeah. So the question I have is, have you learned from that? So yes. are you able to use that knowledge to apply to this year? Oh yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a lot. There were a lot of interesting mechanisms. And then the other thing I would suggest is when you do have your code freeze, try to build it in a way so that you realize that you're not going to have a real freeze per se, but that try to build it so you have component parts so that when you do do the next week upgrade, do it in parts so that way you don't have the overwhelming problem. Usually what happens is like we build all of our algorithms, but because the people are working on the robot, we can't test like the PID constants and things like that. So that's the kind of stuff we change like the day of competition or like the night before. So how many years so they, have they, they use working? they use GitHub. They have a, about yeah. fifteen thousand lines of custom code on top of the starter kit code that that gets distributed. Um, and so, and so they have a highly compartmentalized uh, uh, code organization, and uh, it's just a, it's just it, the real tension is between the drive team, the programming team, and the build team. <laughs> they all need access to the robot, right? Yeah. And and that's what we just that, that's what we haven't conquered yet. And usually, and I win. Yeah. <laughs> Still to win. I win. <laughs> so, uh, and one of the last so. question to the autonomous part, thirty-second one. You know, that in some ways that's 
even more interesting than driving. Though I know the driving is interesting too. But the question I have is how much time does that suck out of your effort then? Not or as do you much guys as it just should. Blow it off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually the code for it, this robot wasn't finished building until the night before competition, yeah. our last one. Yeah. So uh, from about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. I was working on the teleop part. Uh, and then from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., we worked on the autonomous. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. So, we should be spending a lot more time, yeah. but. Um, Unfortunately, we, just because yeah. of our. Com we're trying to work on it this year, because we, especially because we need much more complex. Co but um, we should be investing a lot more time. But in, in prior years, a lot of times we do put a lot of time into autonomous, and that's where we usually get most of our points. Like last year, we got most of our points through autonomous, definitely. Yeah. Yes. I know as a judge in the past, you know how the team, the team comes in and says, Ugh, well, you know, we just didn't have time for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not going to get you a lot of points. It's it's not, not. <laughs> There's actually a counter to that as well. Uh, Arjun was on a different team last year, and they had something called the replay autonomous. Uh, what they did was they would actually take the joystick and move the robot in the directions that they wanted to move in, uh, and the robot or the phone would memorize those, and then that feeds into an autonomous method. So when you hit play, it does that. Usually we try not to do that because it's very imprecise. But it's like you have to position your robot exactly to be able to do that. Yeah, I've tried that yeah. before on my own little robots, and that does not work. Yeah. <laughs> it got us a couple yeah. points, last year, so it's somewhat oh, yeah. effective. Yeah, it's better some, than nothing. A lot of autonomous points you can get from just driving up or something. Yeah. So, so when you guys use GitHub, are you actually doing like pull requests and code reviews and yeah. walkthroughs and so, things? Yeah, uh, so Mr. Ronnie's computer has the main code repository. Uh, and we all submit pull requests to it. Uh, I have admin access, so I can accept them or deny them. Uh, because, uh, but last year our main coder had that access, so we try to use pull requests as much as possible. So even even in high school, you guys are following stuff for principles that are modern. The basics, at least. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you have a question about the number of years? Yeah. How long have you been working? Nine on? years, and Ethan and Evan are the longest members as of now. That's why I win. <laughs> yeah, what's the line? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to come up in the presentation. Yeah, it's going to come up the presentation. We haven't even got the presentation started yet, so we're going to need to kind of move this along a little bit. Let's, uh, 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 so they got they they won the motivate award. Uh, One of the five bigger awards. Which uh, which they'll describe a little bit uh, later on. Uh, can you pop on past? Let's skip this one. Let's skip these. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, I, we did mention the previous one about. So this was at the at the competition itself. So yeah, like uh, so, what happened is there's actually four competitions happening at the World Championships. There's 128 teams in FTC, which is our competition, but there's also FRC ranks next to us who also uses a similar control system, and they have about like 2,000 teams there. Uh, which means that there's so much Wi-Fi interference that we had insanely high ping values. Uh, that's why we had sometimes a 22 second delay when we're on the field. Uh, and also the field was very staticized uh, because there were robots moving all day and things like that. Uh, so we had to counter some of those issues, but eventually we made it through. Those robots all have rolling intake systems, and they're basically little Van de Graaff generators. Right? <laughs> 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 it was even worse on the competition the, not two years, last, two years ago because what we had was this conveyor belt covered in the rubber bands, and that would you just touch it and you short the robot. But we also <laughs> ran in, we shorted every other robot. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it but was the final. I don't think they trace it back to us. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Okay. So our actual presentation. Okay. So this is the this is the part where uh, they're going to get like a 15 minute session with judges at a tournament, and it would begin right here. And Evan's going to take it away. Hi, we're Team 6832 Iron Rain Robotics. We come from SEM, the Science and Engineering Magnet. And uh, before we begin, we'd just like to introduce ourselves. My name is Evan, like I said before, and I am the uh, head of the build team. I'm Karina. I do build and I drive. I'm Benavia. I do blog. Uh, can I build? Charlotte, project manager. Avi, lead programmer and build, er, and modeler. <laughs> Ethan, editor in chief. John Avi, builder. And Ijin, programmer. Okay. And we're missing one. <coughs> yeah, we're missing somebody, but he is gone forever, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, so, okay. <laughs> so, so, next slide. <laughs> so we hail from the School of Science and Engineering in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we're 66% economically disadvantaged. We're interstate school. We're across the. We're, we can see the train river from our school. Despite that, we are hopefully a very good robotics team. Uh, we went to worlds last year, and also all of what you see here today, we did on our own time after school and weekends. None of this is in class. 
So a few summers ago, we took an old 90s RV and renovated it to create our current mobile learning lab, which we take to underserved communities in Dallas to help teach kids about STEM. If you see it anywhere, it looks almost exactly like that today. But the creation and like that was kind of the pilot program, and that was last time. So. The so, X was just to indicate yeah. that they're not claiming any credit for that, for the original build of it this year. I think I may have uh, actually taken that out of your mouth. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's fine. So uh, what this slide is, it's about connections. So connections is just a meaningful conversation we have with somebody who's coming to the RV, whether it be a student, a mentor, or just anybody. This season alone, we've racked up over 200 plus team hours from us working in the RV. We also had 2,300 plus connections, which is over half of where we were by the end of last year. So that's what means we've been making really great progress, and we've been able to improve the MXP throughout the year. Yeah, so just this year we went to our school's uh, freshman orientation. We went to a turn up at Dallas Left Field. We went to another turn up at the Dallas um, Central Library, the one in downtown. We went to Moon Day at the Frontier Supply Museum. So you. And um, SEM STEM Spark, which John is going to so SEM STEM Power Spark was an event we held in coordination with our school, the Science and Engineering Magnet, and it's an uh, event that I'm really passionate about. So essentially we took uh, girls from all over the North Texas region and we invited them, they're uh, middle school age girls, and we just taught them about STEM through different activities we held throughout the day, including... Um, we did chemistry, environmental science, physics, and robotics. Now we mainly focused on the robotics section, so what we did was we had two separate activities within the robotics area. The first one was 3D modeling, where we taught kids how to use program, uh, how to uh, use um, design, CAD design, in order to print out their own uh, 3D print their own keychains. The second one was our block programming station, in which we had a sumo robot game, and we taught kids how to program Mindstorm robots. So. The reason we make a distinction between last year, you know, the creating it and, it and, you know, the sustainment of it last year is because this year what we're doing is with our partner Big Thought, Best Buy, and the Dallas City of Learning, Big Thought has received $150,000 to go towards the creation of a completely new and improved MXP for us to create a place where more kids can come and learn about stuff in addition to the vehicle we have right now. And they put us in charge of um, designing the activities. And they'll be in full deployment uh, all year round. Yeah. So. You see, after you go to a world's torment, you get a lot of people interested in your team. And in addition to that, our school like doubled its size to 175 people per grade. So a lot of people want to join Robox this year. And we grew to accommodate them. So we started two new teams, Iron Star Robox and Iron Core Robotics, in addition to our current team. So we're having a lot of growing pains, but we're helping them get funding for their parts and stuff, and they're helping themselves. And we're mentoring them so that they can join Iron Rain through our varsity system in which Iron Rain's a varsity team and every other team kind of feeds into it. Mm -hmm. So two of the teams are exclusively freshmen, so very few of them have any robotics experience at all. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of all concentrated in Iron Rain, so we're making sure that we're able to teach them what we have, considering the fact that there's a very huge difference between the ability and the level of knowledge in those teams. Yeah. So uh, in addition How to- How many of you are seniors? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's we're going to crash next year. Don't worry, we've been through this before. We've been through this before. You're going to have to do it all. Uh, uh, and it's through that recruitment process that I got on. Arjun, they recruited him over the summer. And Karina has been on a team since freshman year. Uh, I'm a junior right now. Uh, so what actually what happened was uh, Karina and I were uh, Karina Charlotte and I were all on Imperial and Imperial used to be the only like feeder team to Iron Rain and then after we trained we got into Iron Rain so that's the process that we're hoping to follow with all the freshmen that are coming. Um, so we actually went to a scrimmage on October 27th. Uh, it was a very bad day for Iron Rain. Uh, the clouds were uh, cloudy and uh, it was raining. Yes. Um, it's quite sunny. It was but sunny, but uh, in our in our brushes, so. Uh, <laughs> So what happened was uh, we went there just to see what the matches are like, what other teams or robots are like, things like that. Uh, it didn't go well for us. We didn't have a robot working until the last match, at which point it broke during the last match. Um, you broke it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't but, say that in the presentation to the judges, but yeah. yes, that is true. Uh, but, but in the, it was mainly a learning experience for us because we wanted to not only take the other three teams to a tournament, show them what it's like, uh, but also we wanted to see what other robots are like, how teams are working. Uh, but it was a great learning experience for us, and that's how uh, we used that experience to grow on the first competition that we had recently. Um, we'll also be hosting our own qualifier. Our qualifier is basically an, like an entry-level tournament. Uh, it'll be at our school, Town View Magnet Center, uh, on December 15th. 
If you all want to Saturday, please sign up. If you want to volunteer, you just go to ironroomrobotics.com and you hit sign up to volunteer, and then you can volunteer. Yeah, um, you can you can either be a referee and call that game as you go along, or you could be a judge and you all have sort of you know background knowledge and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so we're looking for volunteers. It's a slog. It's an all-day thing. I plan to be there, and I'm going to tell you guys, it's it's definitely a worthwhile experience. It's uh, you get out about. 3:30 mm, ish, four o'clock. You know, I mean, if you want to leave early. And uh, <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it by five, you definitely probably want to leave. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, long it's a really, really uh, good experience. And like the judges' role is also very important because you get to see the story of the team. You see how they developed through the years. Yeah. And that's something that's. You'll, you'll see presentations. You'll, like you'll see a lot of. Well, usually you see a lot of rookie type teams too. So sure. Yeah, these it's are just really interesting times, to yeah. see how the growth growth happens. And there will be thirty more of these kind of robots. Yeah. So if you really want to see what we're talking about in action, that's just as that's as real as it gets. Okay. So um, I ran split up into a bunch of sub teams. We have our builders. We have like our communications team. We have our programmers. And the reason why we do this, although we do switch around, is um, to increase efficiency so we can make the best robot that we can. Okay, so our engine journal is online. Some of you have, have business cards. Uh, we did not have enough for everybody because I just keep them in my wallet. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, so, like everything we do is online and any team can see it. Some, it doesn't actually put us at a disadvantage because it is hard to replicate what we do just by pictures alone. And we'd rather help the first community anyway. Uh, we have visitors from all over the world. The city that most visits us is not actually Dallas, Texas, but Paris, France. Why? We actually don't know. We can't figure it out. If anyone has like an explanation, I'd like to hear it because I don't know. Uh, we also have social media on Twitter and Instagram, at Team6832, like, follow, subscribe. And finally, last year, I talked about how we have every continent represented on our site, except Antarctica, because no one from Antarctica had ever visited our site. We had people from Australia, we had people from Asia, even though there's not or we had people from Africa, even though there's not that large of a first program in Africa, but we had visitors from everyone. And this year, we were at the Dallas Chamber of Commerce presentation, and we were giving this part minus what I'm talking about now, and, and they're like, hey, wait, I have a friend who knows somebody in Antarctica. <laughs> and so she sends out emails to them right now, asking them if they could visit our site. So now we have visitors from every single continent, including Antarctica. Nice. And we're probably the only first team that can say that. <laughs> so we really could have gotten to robot where we are, or even be here today with the help of our partners and sponsors. So as you can see, we have split them up between the partners and sponsors. The top three are the Dell Cyclone and Big Don Best Buy, and they're our partners. So they're the ones who brought the MXP and allow us to make it through deployments. You guys are even on here, uh, the DPRGs, you can see, and the Dallas Makerspace. Ooh, you guys have helped us, not even like just financially, you guys have given us a lot of knowledge and help just to really bring our team and our robot to where it is. You're Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here on Iron Rain, we like to use something we call the engineering process. I'm sure y'all call it that too. Um, <laughs> and basically we start by figuring out what the problem is. We looked at the game this year and then we came up with uh, a bunch of, we conceptualized a bunch of different solutions. Then we actually designed those solutions. Then we built them, we tested them, and then we analyzed the results. And that's how the robot kind of came to where it is today. And right now, it's in the middle of another uh, redesign because you can see these little, uh, little sticky limbs right here, uh, these linear slides. They were added very recently, as in last night, because <laughs> <coughs> they are uh, for a new lift system that we're using. Uh, because the old version wasn't working, it had problems, so we just uh, we went through the engineering cycle again. And the beauty of the engineering cycle is that it works on every part of the robot, from the chassis to our autonomous to the uh, various sub sections of the robot. Uh, we uh, it kind of defines uh, the way we work. So we thought we'd tell you a little bit about it. All right, so connecting. Um, as you, like right, how we're presenting to you guys right now, we like to connect with multiple engineers within our community so that we can both expand our knowledge about the engineering process, but also like learn about how we can further grow from insight from engineers. So thank you for that. <laughs>
So Dallas Regional Chambers meeting. So um, a few weeks ago, actually it may have been a month ago, um, uh, Iron Rain hosted a meeting with the Dallas Regional Chambers. They came to our school and uh, we gave them the same presentations we're giving to you today. This was this consisted of the leader, leaders of Dallas, including people like um, executive at Uber and um, a partner at EY. Just multiple people came together who want to improve the city of Dallas and came to our school to see how they can improve education. So we discussed first sustainability, Iron Rain's history, and we also talked to them. And that's actually where we got the Antarctica help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like as you saw earlier, it gave you the description of how the season's game is going to work. And so we made a list of things that like we prioritize what we're going to do. At the top of that was lander scoring. So that was like getting the little things out of the craters and scoring them in the lander. Then after that was the hook lift. That's where you had like the little noodle arm hanging on there. And lastly was our autonomous. <laughs> so <laughs> those are actually upside down. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, but it was like early. Said, that was early choices. In, in other words, that was our choices at the beginning of the season, and now they've completely flipped. <laughs> Introducing the new Iron Rain special segment called <laughs> Debate Between Two People. <laughs> Introducing on the left side. Hi, my name is Evan Day, and I'm here to represent the uh, Mini Mac robot that we uh, kind of started at the beginning of the year and that's going to be in a future robot we plan on building. On the other side is. I'm Karina, and I'm representing this robot you see here. This is Big Wheel. Okay, so now please present about your chassis. Okay, so I'm going to tell you why my chassis is the best chassis. You see this little boy right here? He's got four oh, nice mechanical wheels that allow him to go in every single direction. Uh, you know, maybe it's, it's always good to have that kind of uh, every way movement in the field. It doesn't matter if it's necessary. It's just, it's a usually big help, especially during autonomous, because it allows us to move uh, in, in ways that are unexpected. Okay, guys, well... The cam wheels are kind of like last season, and so we have this like two wheels per intro drive here with um, big wheel, and you see the wheels are big, so we have a very fast robot, which we need if we want to go between like the pit and then the lander a lot to score points. Part two, introducing lift alternatives. Evan, what do you like to say? Okay, so everybody knows about the linear slide lift, and that's why we kind of worked on it. It's a standard, it's a staple, it's a classic, hey. and it works most of the time. Uh, and so that's what we were trying to go for with this one, and it, it was just a uh, more traditional, but, you know, solid way to go about it. <laughs> okay, so, well, like, we're missing our arms here. Oh, there it is. This is what we originally had. Like Evan said earlier, it's not working too great. This is what we have in place right now. But basically, like, it would latch onto the lander and pull itself up, much like an okay, actual right. pull-up. Well, and we're going to show you something cool about this, too. So, you could have done it up there. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This guy is what we call Superman position. So, when we do this, this is where it can actually reach the lander. Uh, yeah. And then boom, it stands there. up. <laughs> so, is it just a hook that you. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, so, well, like we had on the previous arm, we actually had a, a hook. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was it wasn't way working, long ago. Yeah. That was, yes. Yeah, we had well, a second generation. Y'all can see it if you want. Just pass it around. Okay, there you go. Well, X. Okay, well, the way this one scores is basically it's got the intake system, it's down on its side, and it just uh, eats, it eats up the, the balls and then goes into the high position, and then we have a little thing. It basically just flips up into the high and then dumps out the back. And that's all it has to do. So it allows us to go directly into the pit, backwards, lift, up, go in, back into the pit, and just do that. Over and over again. It's simple. It's uh, and we we thought it was a little different way of doing the lift system. All right, the final part of the debate. Evan, what would you like to say about yours? Okay, I did the corn and the cob intake system, which is this uh, little blue thing that you see John be up here trying to eat. Uh, it's nice. It's super compliant, and it accepts both uh, balls and uh, blocks, which is nice because you know we got to score both of them. Uh, it's currently connected to this uh, a separate intake system that we were going to use, but it's super bulky, so we didn't. It's a little wrap. Anyways, here's my uh, here's, here's so our other intake system was kind of more special. The idea was that we have like a passive way of separating separating the different minerals is what they're called, gold and silver ones. And you know we need to do that because we're scoring the lander. There's one place for the gold, one place for the silver. Um, again, it hasn't worked, but we can like show you the generations of it. So that one has a passive sorter on it. Um, yeah, I'll demonstrate real quick. Okay. So it's very easy. The blocks fall through. The balls are on the ground. 
sounds like it would normally work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but these go through, don't go through. So you can get balls in them. Block just all. You've been watching Yukon Gold. <laughs> that actually was came from. This is the first prototype of it. Uh, we actually use this like this. So, for example, you the ball it just rolls off, right? But if you put the block in. Okay. Don't try this at home, kids. Alright. Okay. okay. First um, version, big wheel. Well, it was just the main lead. The chassis you see here it was bare bones, didn't have much of a lift. Uh, yeah. Progression. The, that's when we added the Superman, the Superman arm, as you can see. It's just like an omni wheel that we stuck on there. So when it turns out, that's how you can get into the high position. Are you trying? I'm going to demo it. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll demo it later. Then, okay, yeah, demo it later. Yeah, three. Is that a servo? Uh, no, it's not a servo. So it's actually connected by two motors up in the front. So John, if you can point to yeah. it. We have tried with just right one, and it wasn't like strong enough to lift. Move the no, arm. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We need about 52 newton meters of torque in order to lift our robot. So. Physics class came in here. Calculations are on our website. If you want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First version. Oh, that's just where we added the. <laughs> it like this. That was on there before. It just, it's just That's not. where we took the competition. So yeah, you can actually slides. see our previous, like our previous linear slides were actually made out of like rev rails, yeah. right? But they're very, they're very janky, and so these are super smooth comparatively. Like, so at our actual competition, we have to like take a hacksaw. Yes, this was a uh, very <laughs> annoying thing. Basically, they just jammed up the linear slides, and they would not uh, go back in. And since you have to start off the game in the 18 by 18 box. And we were doing some testing uh, before the game. It just was stuck in an 18 by 18 position, so it couldn't go back in. So what we had to do, uh, well, we missed that game first of all. It was uh, that was rough. Uh, but basically, we just took a hacksaw right through the center of the uh, little linear slide uh, part of the rev kit. If you've ever seen one, you know how there's little sliders inside. Um, so we just took it. Luckily we had the guy, uh, I don't remember his name, I should, uh, but he's the one who designed them at Rev. He was just at the competition, so he showed us how to fix it and do a very uh, jerry-rigged version that did not really work, but it was better than nothing because it allowed us to slide back in. Did you get the, um, yeah. Did you get purple armor? Um, it's not turning on. Okay. Yeah, so. Okay, so this is our intake for progression. First time we start off with intake, uh, this was a solid uh, piece of, well, I guess it's actually silicone, it's a drying mat. We work next to the kitchen, so that's where a lot of our materials you can come from with the ice cube and with the drying mat. Originally it was a solid uh, piece, and we discovered that uh, because it was solid, uh, whenever the balls went in, it would hit the balls and they would lose their speed, and um, that was bad because we wanted it to actually, when you lift it up, to drop it in. So then that's why we cut the holes in the silicone material to account for that. And then we put on our linear slide so we can lift up and down. So we do modeling in PTC Creo. I don't know if y'all have heard about it, but it's pretty cool. Uh, we do a lot of 3D modeling from this stuff, which is a battery holder, to our own uh, drive system that we created last year called the Revolution System. Um, we even have flexible parts that move around made of NinjaFlex. Um, that we use to sort of test different things. A lot of that's on Kraken, so if y'all want to look at more details about 3D printed parts on there. But the reason we 3D model is because we can print new, unique parts, but also uh, we can develop our own robot models, um, and that's the CAD models that we use to eventually build our design. Uh, I don't think I have one to show you to you day, today, but in the future. All right, materials. So here at Iron Rain, we have this thing where we try to be as resourceful as possible. Now, as John May mentioned, our gold room is conveniently located right next to the kitchen. So we decided to be creative and use, uh, I believe, whoever has it, that's the ice cube tray. The blue uh, cubic part. Yes, that's the ice cube tray. Um, we got it from the kitchen and a turkey tray. Um, so we use these things because we want to be as creative and resourceful with our materials. The way we see it, anything could be used on a robot. You just have to know how to use it. So we got a whole lot of vision. Arjun will talk. Okay, oh, you want to skip over this because we're gonna yeah. talk oh, yeah, about that's it. Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, actually, stop at the IME one. So uh, we use something called the inertial measurement unit. What this has allowed us to do is have um, precise turns. Uh, so this thing, we put it on a turntable. You know why? 
Because when we turn around like this, it'll correct itself. I want to specify that we did like an hour long presentation for y'all like three years ago about IMUs too. <laughs> <laughs> that was that long ago? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Like we, I, I think we have this exact years. slide from, yeah. no, from that presentation. So I just moved it to four. Yeah, here, and now I let it go, and it corrects itself. Yeah, it's almost very cool. Yeah. So yeah. So no one's going to just use the IMU. Yes. Uh, are we going to go down? Oh, oh my god. god. <laughs> 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 so you're relying on the compass at all uh, with the IMU, or are you mainly just using the gyro? And, uh, uh, we're using, actually, we're using all three axes because when we're at a tilted position, we want the drivetrain to slow down or else it'll tip over. He's asking um, about the magnetometers. Yeah, we oh, yeah. use the compass. Or no? Yeah. Uh, I think it's just the gyro. It's just the gyro? Yeah. Okay, and it's on. Uh, yeah. So we have the different venues. It's I mean, you, you don't know what's going to be under the floor. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So it's it actually, and, it, and the, it's the B and O zero five five, and it works fine without without. So you're just oh, using cool. the IMU. The one that you guys introduced yeah. us to. Yeah. Okay. The, the gyro works at the, the B and O five. Yeah. Well, that gyro itself. The whole so it, 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 it gives an integrated solution. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought you said you're. But you can exclude the, the magnetometers. Yeah. 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 No, so it's also using accelerometers. Yeah. Uh, we have four autonomous paths. You won't be able to see them today because we don't have a field here. Uh, but this is what we're planning on using to count for all the points in the autonomous period. Okay. And then so you asked that question earlier. I've been on this team for nine years. I'm 18, so I've been on this team for half my life. <laughs> um, so, but we only had people graduate for like two years ago, so we quickly had to learn like how to make our team so sustainable and how to keep the transfer of knowledge from year to year. And so for example, I took over blog, Evan took over building, I took over perm and so on. But we still want to train each generation so that we can keep our team sustainable for a while. So part of this is like our track where we have three feeder teams where we see the talented people and teach them more so that they can join Iron Rain. But we want to train them not only like be leaders of <coughs> the team but be leaders of our community because we do problems like the MXP and stuff that really matter around the city of Dallas. And so we train everyone on everything, just to make sure they have the skill set needed for later. Um, yeah, that's that's about Ethan. It. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's their normal presentation, except I wouldn't be allowed to talk in uh, in that presentation at all. Um, and if you have any notes on how they can, what, what didn't come through clearly, uh, what they should focus on, that kind of stuff, and you want to share that with us afterwards, we'd really appreciate uh, it. Sure oh, it took more than 15 minutes. That was a loosely uh, paced yeah. version of it. Yeah, they normally have to go like rapid, rapid. Yeah, we were on more tangents. Yeah, you got to leave some time for the, the judges also to answer some Q&A. Do you normally uh, entertain questions midstream from the judges, or is it just... The judges will decide how they want to do it. So sometimes they'll interrupt, and other times... The vast majority of the time, the so they only have to give you five minutes for your time presentation. Oh, wow. They almost always let you run over, and so we normally run to about 13 minutes. And then offer a, a have a little bit in this, so they have a couple of questions here and there, um, but they mostly look pretty saturated by the time the team is done. And again, the, the pace is a little bit faster than what we're doing. The only thing I noticed yeah. was you never mentioned what was. Otherwise, a lot of people want to see the complexity of the, of the robot. Otherwise, right? You know, like the amount of what is what is you know what is the unique feature what. Because later on they have to defend if they become you, you, if they decide to support you. Yeah. yeah. They have to defend why why you your robot is better than everybody else's. And a part of that comes down to the engineering notebook. So yes. the presentation we're that we're, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the yeah. So the presentation we give to you is. Obviously, it does not cover like not not even a tenth of our season. It's just yeah, the I'm highlights. Sure of season. Add, the, the first question I would ask uh -huh. you would be, what makes your robot unique? Well, did I tell you a thing or two? About that? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say you need to think about that. Yeah. 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 You got yeah. fifteen more minutes, more and the judge is not going to give you one second because I was the judge. Yeah. Okay. And I saw you all probably you know, the year, two years back or three years back. Uh -huh. He's right. That you have the problem is you're going to have lots of robots. The judges will have to trickle down to figure out which one will what category. So they'll remember your presentation 
but they also use the books and their notes as reference. Yeah. So Art, you can yeah. get but yeah, the, the, the notebooks, the books and that all together. Yeah, when they look at your notebook, they're going to be looking at your notebook. They won't be looking at your notebook thinking about your robot. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. You see what I'm saying? But the key is you can tie it all together. You'll be better off. In that. Yeah. And you need to have all parts as well yeah. polished as you can. Yeah, this is our presentation is sort of like a, a connection to each part of our notebook. Right. So that's what we try to do. Our engineering notebook is already oh, 400 pages for this season. Thing. No, it's not. No, it's is it 200? Last season. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but anyway, um, I'm working on a robot manual for the judges that we can hand out. That's one or two pages that describes every component of our robot. We took inspiration from another team at Worlds for that, actually. But it, what we plan to do, we, have a, we plan to have a 3D model for every small component of a robot. Just like, for example, with Superman arm, describe what it does and like how we made it. And then, and then finally have a giant 3D model of our robot, and we hope that'll help some of that area. Okay, well, I'm just, yeah, like I say, the, you know, because eventually they're going to go, the robot has to be, in, you have to make an impression with your robot. So, like, if your robot serves soft drinks while, you're, while it's feeding, you know, that's a feature that somebody will say, oh, wow, this guy's, look what they did, they added the soft, word, soft drink refrigerator on it. But uh, if they all they get is this, that you guys, if they don't really end up with an impression of your robot, it'll, because like I say, they got 15 minutes to hear you. They have another team. They usually have 16 20, minutes to judge. 20 minutes, in 20 minutes. So they have to write down all of their impressions of you and everything in that five minute period, all right? And then later on, they'll have to defend their ranking. So I'm just saying that you, so, need, you, you need to think they're not going to be... So to summarize yeah. is basically you need to make it as clear as you can be, as precise as you can be, and, and crisp. Crisp, crisp is yeah. a good word. Because like, like he said, very, very likely after seven minutes you could be, you could be cut off. All right, they could say, all right, that's cool now, tell me about your robot. Now you did some things really, really great. You told when you started out, you said who's what, because usually that wastes a minute. You know, it's like you know, I'm a builder. I'm, I'm. You've been on the team so many years. You know, that's really good piece of information. Just get it out real quick. You know, just say hey, you know, we we've been, we got people, and you even and even say you know, and I'm a senior, so I'm not going to be here next year. Yeah. And that I just want to. That all those qu all those type of team questions get they're out and gone, you know. And he's he has a point, but and, and you have to realize there are going to be different judges and different groups. He was up one judge in one group, I was in another, yeah. and in San Paulo my group, they one of the things they did later on talk about was one team for one of the wars on how they presented to the community and that. So that's why. It's going to be hard to get everything, but the key is if you can have trips and that so present and how you're doing the community, how you have the yeah, that's teams underneath that you're bringing up to take care of the future. But so I think also you have to realize so, yeah, that you might you go to several interviews, I believe. So you go to the you, technical interview. You get no, you get a you get a single interview okay. at this one. Uh, every team is guaranteed one interview, and it happens first thing in the morning. And that's a, a, like a whole series of teams that you get panels of judges in rooms. They see usually six different teams. Um, and it's only if you grab the interest of your panel of judges that they're going to now take it into deliberations and sort of advocate for you. So you got to capture their attention first. Yeah, yeah. Then what happens is, in the pit area throughout the rest of the day, if you're being considered for certain awards, then other teams of judges will come across, come, come out to get more information from you. So this is about what this this presentation is about: wetting the appetite and making sure that they say, "This is a team that you you other judges need to go see," because yeah. otherwise you're relying on a, just a, a small panel of a large group of judges. And the hardest part for the judges is deliberating and sharing that information later on. When well, that's where it's important to have something that's unique 
Yeah, we get really and technical that. at those at, and when and we're in the field. When we're in the field. Also, you're putting that to have yes. that can refer back to sort of I mean, I do a real summary sheet type thing. Yeah, yeah they have so cheat sheets to handle. I know. That's so. okay. <coughs> Carl? Yeah, you know, you know uh, what I really liked was when you got it, uh, I don't know how to balance the community outreach and sustainability kind of stuff with the presentation, but when you get to the pres presentation of the robot, I found it really interesting to see that strategy slide. And, I, and as, as a viewer, I would love to see, I, can, I think you could even start with the strategy and say, well, you all know the rules. We decided to approach it by focusing on this and this and this, and that drove the design of our system. And then if they want to ask you how you actually got there, you can back into it and explain. But at least you lead with, this is the approach we're going to take to conquer this thing. Yeah. And it led to this design right here. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm a software guy, and uh, if I was judging, I might you know, actually start asking you guys about how you designed your software, how you layered your software. Uh, so, how uh, you're maintaining in, the robustness, yeah. and especially thinking about sustainability, mm -hmm. how you pass that knowledge down. When you're talking, I don't know, you said 15,000 lines of code? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's getting there, right? It's, it's it could be bigger, it could be smaller, but at 15,000, you start getting into some complexities mm -hmm. where you need to have uh, solid design principles, software patterns being used, those kind of things. So make sure your engineering notebooks cover that and that you're ready to answer those kind of technical questions if you end up getting a judge like me. We actually yeah. skipped over the software part in our original presentation because this is all software from this point on forward. Yeah. Um, this is specifically about computer vision. Yes. All right, so we're going to go ahead and launch. We adv advertised that we would talk a little bit about where we're going, what we're experimenting with in, in CD. Uh, so this section is going to, this is not rehearsed, so <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was thrown awesome. together this week. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. So, we have computer vision, and Mr. Ronnie is our wonderful sponsor of it. <laughs> okay, uh, so here's the basics of what we're going to be covering. Uh, we're going to be talking about first what F FTC control system looks like, what the FTC app system is, like for example the robot uh, phones communicating with each other, and we're going to go into our uh, specific uh, vision libraries that we tried testing out so far in the season, and going on for uh, and our future plans with it. Okay. Uh, you explain oh, sure. So FTC app is the baseline framework given to us by FTC for us to start our programming in. So it's actually an Android Studio project. It has all the low-level libraries for communicating with hardware devices, and we just have to use those libraries. So we have two Android apps. We have one driver station and one robot controller phone. So the robot controller phone driver station are linked with Wi-Fi Direct, and so we have a driver controlled using a joystick connected to one phone, and the other phone is connected to the robot directly to all the motors, and so we program the robot phone to interact with the driver phone. So I select the uh, correct off mode that I want, hit initialize, hit play, I can hit control A to connect the controller, um, and then I can move stuff. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, here's how the control system actually works. Arjun went over a little bit of it. Uh, so, you can have up to two game pads, and they plug in using an OTG cable to your controller. Uh, and this is controller to your drive station. Uh, the driver station communicates via Wi Fi Direct to the robot controller phone, which is connected to an uh, onboard processing unit, and which controls the rest of the robot. So, here's what the actual connections look like um, we have something called a Rev Expansion Hub. Uh, you can sort of see it here, it's this thing, or over here. We have two of them on the robot, two of them are the maximum. Uh, and they're sort of like power units that control the robot. Um, so the Android phone tells all the commands to the rev hubs, uh, and the rev hubs distribute that information to the rest of the robot. So there's a battery that plugs in, uh, the phone that plugs in, and then all of our sensors, including servos, uh, I, I, I2C sensors, color sensors, all of that stuff, plugs in, including motors and things like that. And the uh, battery is connected via a switch, so we can turn it off, turn it on easily. Uh, and that's the basics of how everything is put together on this. It'll drive four motors uh, with encoders um, and six servos. Uh, so per rev hub. Per, a, per hub. So yeah, yeah. We're allowed to have two in a row. You've got two of them. Yeah. You have a limit in FTC. The game rules are you can have up to eight main motors and up to 12 servos. And the robot the that you see back there was maxed out. <laughs> that one had eight ro yeah. Eight motors, it was well complete. Eight motors, <laughs> 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 Otherwise, that 12 volt, 300 milliamp, 
It's all all from the one battery. So your maximum oh, yeah. current is, is is limited. Yeah. Some teams hypercharge their batteries because they can't handle it. Uh, so the Renault Extension Hub. We'll go over what the details are. So it's actually made by a former DPRG member who now works for Rev Robotics. Yes, that's the his company. Uh, and Rev sort of built, makes the control systems for everything we use, and from the Rev hubs to even the linear slides. These these rails that you see is also made by Rev. Things like that. Uh, motors are made by Rev. Sensors and on and on. Uh, so here are the actual dimensions of it. Uh, so they have uh, uh, four motor ports here, including encoders. Encoders are basically values that uh, detect exact movement of the motor, so we can find distances and things like that. Uh, we have some sensors here and here that work with it, and also two uh, power stations, so we can control between the hubs. Okay, so the game elements for this year's game, part of our autonomous is we have to be able to recognize these. We'll talk about that later. So we have gold cubes and silver balls. Silver is a loose term. Very loose term. That's gold either. That went yellow. So you have silver here. Because we're mining on the moon and we're going for gold and silver. Sure. One is silver, the other is gold. So the question is, why do we need computer vision for this Spears game in the first place? And the answer to that is one big main part of the autonomous is sampling. And that's what it's called. So basically the idea is our robot, without using driver control, has to be able to detect we have three minerals in a line. One of them is gold, one, two of them are silver. We don't know what order they are in because field personnel shuffle them. And if we knock off only the gold mineral, we get 30 points. If we knock off a different one, we lose those points. 30 points is a lot of points, especially yeah. early game. Uh, so, are we just using like blob detection to we'll so go we, into that? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, first thing we, first library we have access to is something called Euphoria. Uh, Euphoria is in something created by PTC. Uh, they come in little, little sensors like this. This is from last year. We don't have one from this year since we're not trying to focus on it this year. Um, so, uh, what the objective is is there's a onboard. Uh, it's built into the FTC app. It's something called Euphoria. We can. In it, um, Implement it into our code, and if we point the camera at it, uh, it has some. It, it has built in like this this image in it. Uh, no, it's not connecting to car. Um, but basically, it should be able to recognize it, and based on its position, we can orient our robot to follow it. Uh, we would have a demo with Cartbot about it, but unfortunately, it's not working right now. So we'll try to see if we can get that by the end of the day. So the only difference is these things change. So instead of like one, some are black, some are orange, they swap around. And this one's actually the left one. So last year it was used to figure out which column to place it in. There's left, middle, and right. Um, and that moved around last year, so that's why we used before to detect it. Um, so it's this like a custom tag. Yes. And this year it's used to basically, uh, when you deploy from the lander, you see a V4 target right in front of you. So you can use your robot to orient itself, and that's when the timer starts. And uh, here's a little bit of how it works. So we're also using OpenCV, and there's some conflict between before and OpenCV in terms of camera. Um, so what happened two years ago was there was a before target right under the beacon. It didn't look like this, it looked like something else. It was like right here. So when the robot was started in autonomous, first thing you would do is find the before sensor. And based on it, it would orient itself and face it. Drive up to the beacon, and then OpenCV would turn on, and we'd be able to check which other, whether it's blue or red and we're supposed to hit the alliance color that was ours. So we were basically balancing those two libraries when we were using it two years ago. Alright, so OpenCV. OpenCV is basically your baseline computer vision algorithms, and that's what most teams up until this year have been using. So OpenCV is a collection of basic algorithms, something from color blob detection to maybe image resizing, or detecting contours. And so it's a very stable library. It's been used forever. It's very efficient because it's all written in native code. And yeah. Uh, native code is C and C++? No, Java. No, native code. So, so OpenCV is going to be written in C oh, yeah, yeah. to be able to have low level access to things like the camera. It's compiled. So, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so it supports upper level libraries too, like Python and 
uh, or upper level languages, but its its basic implementation is usually native, even on Android. So the the version for that they're using is called OpenC for Android, uh, and uh, you can write your own native code as well to connect with it directly. It usually goes through the Java wrappers that they also provide. Yeah, so the Java wrappers we call it Java Native Interface (JNI), and it basically lets us call C code from Java. Because especially since the J Java virtual machine, Dalvik virtual machine on Android phones is written in C, so we can interface between those two. Oh, okay. So OpenCV is one of the possible approaches we are using this year. We actually have multiple possible approaches, and this presentation is about all of them. So OpenCV is easy to use and design. There are tools that really help us make it even easier to design, and we've had a good track record with using OpenCV because Iron Rain has used OpenCV many times in the past few years. Some of the cons for OpenCV include the fact that we can only really test these predefined pipelines on images, lighting conditions that we have images for. So if a competition has different lighting conditions than what we've actually tested our pipeline on, it has a chance of failing or just completely detecting the wrong mineral. Yeah, like for example, two years ago at the Houston World Championships, they're playing on a Minute Maid Park, and the lighting is there is not exactly the best it can be. So everybody's uh, computer vision was not working. So it was, it was big floodlights. Uh, to mm -hmm. light up the it's a terrible thing that happened. And the other thing is, if you use certain things like machine learning, that has a little bit of a wow factor for the judges <laughs> to impress them. OpenCV is something that just doesn't have that factor, especially for judges who don't have much funny? experience with okay. <laughs> old vision is so blase. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the buzzwords. <laughs> so I'm gonna drop some more buzzwords on you guys. <laughs> by, the, by the way, that's our second excuse. Okay, so OpenCV for Android is basically a way of getting the OpenCV library, which was actually not designed for Android phones, to run on Android. So we already covered all this. Oh, we did? Right. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. But here's the thing. OpenCV code looks a little bit scary, and that's just for a pretty basic pipeline I threw together in like 20 minutes. So we do have tools like Grip. Grip is a drag and drop tool to help you design CV pipelines and it helps you visualize it. You may be thinking, but I'm too advanced for drag and drop. I don't want to be using something like Scratch, but OpenCV actually really helps you learn, oh, the Grip helps you learn about OpenCV. So instead of just using a whole bunch of lines of code, you make one change, you recompile everything, run it again, and that's a long cycle. Grip just helps you visualize it, you can drag around sliders to get the constraints to be exactly what you want. And so this is our OpenCV pipeline, the one that we've been developing. So it actually seems to be working pretty well, as you can see in these photos. It's able to do the technical and all that we need. Hmm. And so we have a video of it in action with a lot more photos. So do you convert it to um, RGB or do you use so, uh, HSV? Actually, or the pipeline is actually. Uh, so we use the HSV color space just because HSV allows us to have different lighting conditions and not be constrained. Okay. So the pipeline is actually written in here. So what we do is first resize the image so we can read less uh, pixel values. Then we normalize it so we get the um, basic brightness part of it out of the way. And then we use HSV threshold to identify the true material in there. And then we use a fine contour. Uh, to be able to detect the exact contour that we need. Right. So mainly you're paying attention to your hue and your saturation and not yeah. so much value. That's what got yeah. you when you're okay, <laughs> saturating or whatever. Okay. So we do have a few cases of anomalies. So as you can see in some of these pictures, we have two blobs detected. The red one is our actual gold cube. The yellow one is something that's not the gold cube we're looking for. And the simple solution to this is only look at the one that's lowest on the screen, that has the lowest Y value, because that's the, going to be the blob that's closest to us. Mm -hmm. Can you also discriminate by size? Yes. So that's actually being, that's a lot of discrimination already. So go back to see this. So what we have right here is before we do any discrimination based on the size. Mm -hmm. So if we constrain it even a tiny bit more, we cut the risk of discriminating against our actual cube. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep the constraints loose enough so that we always have a cube, but we don't want to add extra... And that's what all these parameters are doing here. They're filtering out the size. Yeah. Zero cubes. 
So it's really nice to have an interactive designer like this. You know, there's Robo yeah, Realm. Yeah. Oh, there's yeah. other things. Robo but this Realm one, like this yeah. one, yeah. So this one, but this one is 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 newer and it seems to be cool. pretty feature complete. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's open free. CD. It's open source. It's developed by WPI. Uh, and they chose to publish it and release it to all robotics teams. So Windows, Linux, Mac. It runs on every game. Yeah. Really? Yeah. If you tried the uh, image segmentation in your pipeline, because there's uh, yeah. there's some routines that'll try and separate things that look alike, and they might help you uh, split out. You know, when you have the the cubes and the balls near each other, they might help you uh, segment them and separate them before you do the like color and other. Haven't thought about that. We'll try it. <laughs> So, so everything we see there, you can yeah. programmatically yeah. alter the knobs. Which you, you can set it up like this, but I assume then you can go in and yeah, these are all sliders, all like just like move it around. But I mean, you can do that with your program. Yeah, you, you could say, do that run it between here and there. And, okay. Does yeah. Grit give you an option cool. to export this? Yes. Code? So Grit basically has you can just do I think file export. You can export it to Java, C, plus plus, Python. Python. I think one more, I forget what the other yeah. one is. But basically they built this for, like, you can use it for pretty much any language. Can you go backwards? Sorry. Uh, I don't think you can go backwards. Okay. Sorry. Is the exported code for OpenCV or you have to run grip on your target? Uh, no, it's for OpenCV. So oh. this is only like a filtering thing. It's just just, just to figure out what code it's you need. So this code is actually the one that's been generated by yeah. grip. This is straight generated from grip. No changes, things like that. Yeah. No code. Sandy. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't round trip. Right. It doesn't what? It doesn't round trip. Where you can go back. Where you can go oh, back, yeah. and, back okay. and forth between yeah. the code. You update the code and then it runs the pipeline. Do you find you have issues with frame rate? Yes, there are some issues with frame rate. Uh, but if we just lower the sampling rate mm -hmm. and uh, decrease the uh, pixel, like the amount yeah. of pixels that we're getting, uh, then it's not too much of an issue. If we move slow enough, we lose the fact where we're going. Oh. And majority of the time, if, when we when we drop down from the lander and we just turn it on there, if, just for a couple seconds, just to figure out where it is, that's all we need. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be stationary anyway; we won't be moving or anything like that. Yeah. So do you um, are you using like you know uh, 320 by 240 or? Yes. So it's right now 320 by 240. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hold that. So can't work there. <laughs> Put your glasses on. Yeah, they offer you some glasses. So yeah, they're free for. Uh, Ron's got you, you, you need to turn your eyes to six forty by four eighty. So as Arjun said, it's not that buzzy anymore. Everybody uses Open CV. Ah, that's too it's late. Old. <laughs> Let's go to machine learning. So TensorFlow is a recent library that was developed by Google. And it has a bunch of uh, neural network models that we can use to uh, do some processing. So it's an open source a machine learning thing. TensorFlow Lite is the one that runs on mobile devices, uh, developed from the original TensorFlow library, which runs on all computers and things like that. Uh, so basically, you build it in TensorFlow, you can for, convert it to TensorFlow Lite, and you develop it into a mobile app, which we can run on the computer, or not the computer, on the Android phones. Um, so and it can generate for iOS as well as Android. So for those of you who may have forgotten where neural networks are or you don't know what they are, uh, I'm just going to go over them a little bit. Uh, so basically what happens is there's a bunch of input neurons. Uh, that's what gets the actual values. Um, we use something called a convolutional neural network. So it basically gets all the pixel values of all the images that are on our, uh, on our image and it runs through all those values. There's a bunch of hidden neurons. We, we type in the layers but we don't know what's happening. It's, an, it's a black box. It's unfortunate. Uh, we don't have anything to read them right now. But in the end, we end up with uh, several labels, and those labels will be able to learn the images and how their labeling system works. Um, so in terms of object detection, uh, TensorFlow uses a uh, has one feature called convolutional neural network. And the way that works is it's basically a sliding window classifier. And it runs through the image and tries to find similarities, feature detection. For example, in this case, it might be detecting the shape of his jaw or something like that to identify the facial recognition part of it. Um, but in our case, we don't go as far as deep. So basically what's happening is when we run the TensorFlow model, the gold cubes are going to be, it's going to search through the entire image like that as a sliding window classifier and look at only the part that's highlighted. And if it detects that there's a gold cube in that location, so that's the boundary of the gold cube. If it doesn't see it, it just moves on to the next location and it'll keep doing that, getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it finds the gold cube. So obviously, to do all this stuff, you need data, right? Yeah. Where do we get the data? Oh, okay. I'll go over this first. Uh, so TensorFlow was bundled straight into the FTC app. Um, first actually released an update where they built a pre-made TensorFlow model and they gave it to all teams so they could detect cubes by themselves. Uh, so that's a ready-to-go model, yeah. no training required. 
right? Yeah. No understanding of how it was built either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't see the input layers, we can't see the output layers, we can't see any of the details in it. But that's what, it was a basic starting point that was given to all teams. Um, and obviously, these are some drawbacks of it. For example, there's a black box. It's like, we don't know what's happening in there. Especially with the one with first, it's literally just model dot, like, train. Or not even that, it's just like model dot fit. Uh, which is just, like, we have the model, we're just training it. Or like, we're just using it. Uh, that's why we tried to go on our own way and try to figure out our own. Uh, methods for it. It's also a little bit sketchy performance. Uh, for example, if it doesn't detect it automatically, like it has a little bit of lag period, and that may mess up our robot. Uh, but we're trying to account for all those details. Yeah, and some of the other weird things happening with TensorFlow is if the mineral is on the left, we've had higher accuracy detecting it than it's, if it's on the right. And one of our sister teams said that they mounted their phone sideways, and it had much higher accuracy. <laughs> So it's really weird. Uh, so here's how the detection actually works in here. We set up minerals on the other side. Uh, this is silver, gold, silver, and is able to detect the difference between the three. And in this case, it's in the middle. And this picture actually took me like 20 minutes of fiddling around with the position to take. <laughs> so are you using OpenCV with TensorFlow? No, then? this is purely TensorFlow. TensorFlow. Okay. Yes. So in other words, the output one doesn't feed into that. No, uh, but we can in integrate it to do both. So for example, you can use a CV pipeline to threshold it to identify the uh, highlights of the image, and then going with, CV, uh, with TensorFlow to learn those highlights. Oh. And you can do it that way. But for this, for this sake, we didn't do that. So here's some pros and cons of it. Uh, yeah. So with that problem you had, like, it could only detect left, and it not, couldn't detect right one. Mm -hmm. Did it try the lightning part, like lightning? Lighting, light yeah. Or like reducing yeah, so we even tried putting an LED strip on it. Uh, the reason was like the screen wasn't as wide as we needed it to. And also there might have been an issue with the model training in, in their lighting conditions that we don't know about. Uh, so it's something that, so the app that you saw, you see here, is uh, FTC native. Uh, it's not the one that we trained. So it did, we didn't train it under our lighting conditions or the field's lighting conditions. This is what first thought was a good lighting condition and they gave this model. So we don't know what they trained it in, so we can't tell whether Lighting is the issue or not. We, we tried using a few LED strips, we still had some recurring issues. They say it was um, trained against multiple lighting conditions, but exactly what that means, we, you know, we have no idea. So, so, they, will so, so, so they, had, they had an LED strip on the uh, last year's robot. Um, they'll have it remounted on this one wherever the phone ultimately ends up pointing. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to train under our own on bot lighting positions, right? So the robot itself will take all of the samples uh, mm -hmm. under that LED lighting, yeah. and then and then it'll sort of play it back in competition. It'd be fun to feed it a fake image with uniform lighting where you don't have any weird gradients, just to see if their thing is weird That's for real. Works. But you probably yeah. don't have time to do that. Yeah. All right. uh, so a couple pros are like, OK, so TensorFlow itself is not very easy to learn. But the way that FTC presented to us is easy because they basically just train the model instead of here, use the model. And they went through step by step of how their code works and we, a lot of teams just implemented that directly. Uh, it's already integrated into the FTC app. However, we obviously it's a black box. It's very sketchy performance. And there's, uh, there's like, like, we don't know exactly why it's working. So there's not like really a wow factor that comes with it either. So Aaron Rain was like, nah, we'll figure this out. <laughs> And that's when we decided to create our own uh, neural network. Yeah. Uh, using TensorFlow's library, we used a CNN, uh, which is a convolutional neural network, and uh, we wrote it in Python to originally test it. Arjun will go over how we created everything. And to be honest, we actually had the idea of doing convolutional neural networks before FTC released the TensorFlow update. Yeah. So we were the trendsetters. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they gave yeah. it to everybody. <laughs> Last summer, I spent at MIT doing machine learning stuff with uh, medical data. So then I decided to bring that into FTC and try to figure that out with minerals. Uh, obviously, first was like, nah, we'll, we'll steal your idea. Uh, but Arjun will go over into how we sort of tested it. So out. first, the training objective. We're going to actually know. Before that, I wanna, we're going to walk you guys through the process of how we designed our neural network. So of course, our neural network. It's not the best it could be. It, in fact, really doesn't work much at this point, but our hope is that we will eventually get it to work, yeah. and then we hope that any of you, if you guys want to train your own neural networks, you'll be able to do it by following our process. So the, the first thing, stole. what did it say? The one that first stole from us. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the first thing you have to do when you're designing a neural network, or really any art of machine learning algorithm, is to figure out what your training objective is. So we decided that given an image, we want to be able to find the coordinates of the gold mineral. 
So we took an image, and our idea is for it to pinpoint the location of the gold mineral. And so the first thing we have to do is capture training data. So when you're capturing training data, you want to get as many possible different uh, conditions. So we had different angles, different positions of the mineral, different lighting. So we actually use a front-facing camera on the phone to train it because that's what will actually be running on the robot. And then so the second part is once you have photos, you have to label it. So the idea behind the neural network, for those of you who don't know, is you feed it labeled input and it learns patterns from it. And now this is supervised machine learning. We're not trying unsupervised yet, so that's why we're doing this. But yeah. Okay, so once we feed it those trained labeled data, then if we feed it unlabeled data, we can, the neural network will predict the location of the gold mineral. So what we have to do is label training data. Go back, two slides. So we have, we could be labeling this by hand, looking at an image, finding the coordinates of the gold mineral, but that's too difficult. So we decided we're going to write a program to help us write a program <laughs> in the neural network. So we wrote something called Mineral Labeler, and it's available online at GitHub. And so it basically allows us to click on the location of the gold mineral. And so not only does it take the image and allow us to label it, it also does some pre-processing of resizing the training images to a good resolution and converting it to an easy CSV format rather than a JPEG format. So uh, we uh, train the models using Python and TensorFlow. So with Arjun's program, we actually got all the labels in CSV format, and we loaded them into a database. Uh, then we loaded that into TensorFlow uh, using Python, uh, and we train our models through it. Uh, so here's actually the CNN structure. Uh, so what happened was we created two convolutional uh, layers first to first detect those uh, elementary features. Then we used max pooling. Uh, and we did a few more things. We, I commented a couple of them out because we're just testing with different things. This is like the final version that we sort of created. Flatten, and then we created a dense layer to basically train it as, does it have it or not? Or no, sorry, it's the exact coordinates of where it is. Um, and then we compiled it and we fit it using Atom Optimizer. And we ran 300 epochs, it's not a lot, but it's a starting point. How long did that take? So this took about uh, a minute one minute for each training thing. Yeah. How much training data did you end up with? So um, that's enough. where we failed. So yeah. we had about uh, 110 images. So obviously that's very, very small for a neural network. Um, and especially with the, the way we created it was we label the exact coordinate of it. So the neural network had terrible accuracies. I think we had 33% accuracy. Uh, which is less than random. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> from there, what we're planning on doing, or actually, I'll go a little bit later. But so we tried this again using uh, Java and DLJ4. So uh, DL4J is basically like a competing library to TensorFlow. So DL4J is developed by Eclipse versus TensorFlow is developed by Google. So DL4J basically allows us to do everything in Java rather than because we've been training it in Python up until then. And of course, our robot code is all written in Java, so eventually we'd need to convert it to Java. So DL4J gave us a way of, tw of running this on Java. Um, have you guys, uh, you, it looks like, okay, you had a picture of uh, Adrian Rosebeck up there, so I guess you're somewhat familiar with that, that object through there. Would that be of any use to you guys? Because you're you're actually trying so to... So you're talking about persistent object tracking? Like you yeah. indicate something that's a region of interest right. at a particular point in time, and then it starts from that point that's tracking, right. whatever it'll, that is? It'll look, yeah, through... Yeah. Uh, he, has, he has several different videos that he um, he tracks, like, uh, the back of cars, you know, on roadways. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I think one Horses was, and races. Yeah, horses and races, uh, uh, runners the, and one race. of, So one of that sort of requires some sort of feedback on exactly what it is, the thing that you're looking for, right? Uh, and this is during autonomous period, and they're not allowed to like this stuff is randomized. They don't know where it is, so so oh, you can't okay. you can't now if you if you can save the uh, the features of that thing. Ahead of time, yeah, uh, and then run it, run that back through. Then yeah, that's something then, that look at. Well. Um, yeah. I think you can. They they have different amounts, you know, of varying performance. Um, so you, if you're allowed to um, train it beforehand, like select an object, and then let the object get out of field of view. Um, some of them actually work with it coming back in field of view, and yeah. and it can track it. Others, so that's, that's kind of how. Not. 
their uh, like two years ago, their color blob detection worked. Mm -hmm. So you would uh, uh, use touch screen phone. So you identify the thing you want to track. Oh, okay. And touch yeah. touch that and live and the, under those lighting conditions, uh -huh. it evaluates what oh, that is okay. and then sort of uh, tracks that. Okay. There are rules against being able to do that in this scenario. Oh, there are. <laughs> well, how about this? Uh, just I'm, this doesn't. This is more of the blob kind of idea, but I kind of like the idea of okay. So you take your picture and you think you think you know where the object is. What I like is then you change your perspective a little bit, and this gets a little complicated. But so as you change your position, and you take another sample, and that way, if you get some false detects, at least. If, if you go to the trouble of knowing, okay, I've moved so far and where I expect it to be and is it there, and that sort of thing, then I guess what I'm talking about sure. is a filtering process. Right. You know, that's, but that's more in the blob area, and I don't know about the neural network stuff. I've studied a little bit, and I don't know anything. So. It's also some really good ways to increase your training data from the 120 photos or image samples you've had, sure. quadrupling that yeah, over and over again by rotate the image or blur the image at noise. Yeah. Or, you can yeah. take just a small amount of data and duplicate it. Yeah, we looked at possibly translating the image and then labeling it, but we noticed that a lot of our images had the gold mineral on the end, the very end. We didn't actually frame our images very well, so that we'll, we probably have to go back take better pictures. Yeah. Uh, so this is the CNN structure written again in Java. Um, it's very similar, like you can see the exact same stuff happening. It's just it's done in um, DLJ4 version of it. Um, so. Obviously, our models didn't work very well. Um, the issue was the training data. So uh, I was thinking about different alternatives we could do. Uh, since we labeled only one coordinate, we're thinking also creating an area of interest instead. So if we label all of that, like a square around the mineral, or like fill in that square with the correct information, then we'd be able to detect that area instead of just the coordinate. Did you, uh, do your training things just have like a kind of a regular background with just one object? or? No, so the, the picture you saw of in the actual thing was what our training data looked like. So it, it was just like this. This is what you'll see on the field. Mm -hmm. This is what you'll see at all competitions. It will be the three minerals and the crater behind it with a bunch of noise, basically. What's junk in the background, though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a tent that's sitting over my pool <laughs> in the backyard where they have to pra have their practice. Field. Yeah, question? What, what I'm thinking is I haven't done this much, but when I, when, uh, we did this for our beer finder robot. Uh -huh. And when we made the training data, we, uh, uh, and I think this is a good practice from what I've understood, but you want, like, you take that carpeted area, mm -hmm. which is a kind of flat background with no clutter, mm -hmm. and then you just have nothing but one and two and five and ten. You have the gold objects, different combinations of gold objects, different positions. Mm -hmm. Then you'd have the silver balls, but it'd just be a flat background with silver balls. Mm -hmm. And I think when you do that, then it helps. Um, it helps, it helps the neural net understand the, diff, uh, mm -hmm. the separation between what you're looking for, and it gives you a better chance of picking them out from all that clutter. Okay. In other words, you're saying that the clutter tends to so confuse the, the, the network training. in terms of training. In terms of what's right, yeah. yeah. So you want a pure, you want a clean when you background. When you train. Yeah. Well, if you want a real-world discriminator, then you need to have, you, if you need it to work in situations that are noisy, then then you don't want to train it that way. You yeah. want to do the exact Because then it'll overfit to the data where it's mm -hmm. distinguished, but when we come back yeah. to this, it won't. I, I mean, but but that, could be used. Yeah. that could be used Is for it? the near minerals in this particular situation. Uh, what we haven't talked about, we haven't even talked about it internally yet, is are we going to think about... Um, using uh, computer vision to find the minerals later in the game during the teleop phase, and help help okay. help steer the robot to pick up the minerals for the scoring part. So you mean in a cluttered so field, you yeah, want to pick yeah. things out, not just actually this like example, in that pit. Yeah. Like the goal is we don't need a driver. Out. That's our goal <laughs> for this robot. It's in the rules. Once you go in, once you get this guy, this is an issue. But when you move into the teleop. Uh, do the different minerals have different values? No, no. they're the same. No, they're the same. They're the same value. It's, uh, uh, they're the same value in the in the upper targets. They they're, they're worth less in the. They're, they're, you can also place them in the corner of the field. Yeah. Uh, but if you get them up back back into the lander, then they're all worth five points. No. So they, you're probably not going to probably squeeze them into the field unless it's the last second. No, you're, yeah, you're, going yeah. to be, you're going to be pulled up. So, so we're probably going to optimize on the on the balls, <laughs> the silver minerals, 
because um, they're the nearer placement, right? The, in other words, that part of the lander is facing the, so we're just, that way we just go back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, and they're actually easier to manipulate and, and get in. Mm -hmm. um, so. You had a question? So yeah, it's more of a comment. Um, so I have some experience with uh, machine learning algorithms in general. And I know with convolutional neural networks, you know, in this is the typical training set you do for convolutional neural networks, handwritten digits, right? Yeah. And one strategy people use to increase their data set is just rotate the images. Right? Yeah. Did you guys do that? Uh, yeah. No. So that that's part of the sustainability part of it. So we're thinking about ways to adapt the model. Uh, mm -hmm. That was one way I was thinking about it. Another way was uh, segmenting it. So we'd have a bunch of negative values, right. and then we have. Where, where the only the gold part of it is would read is basically a binary classifier whether mm. it's there or not right. and then we put the image together and then it'll use that uh, those binary images to tell our actual position sure um, that and several other things we're trying to look for, uh, look to try but fortunately first shot us down with that model they oh so the rotating images thing I uh, no, no they basically they published their their own model of it so oh, okay. <laughs> so we're trying to see if we could use that instead of having to in there so use yeah. their model and then try to improve it or just use their model? Period. Yeah, so basically we started this process because we wanted to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and then first drop the model on everybody. So all the teams know how to implement it, but right. not many teams know the background of it. Right. So we tried to learn the background so we could figure out what the optimized conditions are and things like that. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna sort of urge them to try out uh, sort of retraining. So take ImageNet mm -hmm. uh, as a very well-developed discriminator uh, and then uh, and then add extra layers to it to, right. uh, to to add in sensitivity about these particular elements. Yeah, that's a few. It's called transfer learning, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole that's the whole part of that. But um, one other thing that I haven't seen you maybe talk about in the future uh, that can help you out is I don't know. I'm not sure how you're doing you're optimizing your hyperparameters. Do you know? How, did you guys already talk about your hyperparameter tuning? This is what we're doing. So yeah, uh, I sort of messed with it a little bit. We didn't uh -huh. do too much of it. Uh, we're maybe doing a. Uh, I was planning on maybe doing a grid search. Okay. So it optimizes it, uh, but obviously it takes a very long time to run a grid okay, search yeah. on a neural network. Uh, but we've tuned these by hand, sort of, but they haven't worked very well simply because of our training data. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. you know when you have images. Yeah. That's your yeah. feature space is huge, right? Yeah. So. Um, and I would say that's interesting. I was actually looking at it's, it's interesting you're talking about this because it's what I want to talk to somebody here about. Um, I know grid search, random search, those are the two types that people generally implement. Mm -hmm. Random search, I think people have better luck with just because your feature space is so big, yeah. right? There's randomly picking spaces. Yeah. Uh, but I actually came across one recently. It's using these things called like uh, like a Gaussian something. Yeah, remember. Gaussian blur. No, no, no. Gaussian it's um, it's a Gaussian process, right? Oh, okay, okay. And it's, so it's trying to um, uh, have a more smarter way of tuning hyperparameters, so it's okay. something you might want to look into. Yeah. I've actually just started recently doing that, and I've had some luck with it, right? Mm -hmm. So it might help you out because it's been my experience with hyper with machine learning. It's like it's great, you know, I can implement this thing, right? Man, these hyperparameters, there's so many, and they seem to they seem to have you know something going on there. So grid search, random search, and that Gaussian process seems to be. Um, an interesting new way that people have been talking about to, yeah. to optimize those better, right? So, and then rotating your images is another thing I say yeah. could help you out to increase, because you know, the, the theory, the philosophy is the, uh, they call it the unreasonable effectiveness of data, <laughs> yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So the more data you have, whoever has the most data effectively wins, even right. with the different models, right? Yeah. So yeah, and you can tune how many layers you have mm -hmm. and how many, you know, nodes yeah. are in your layers. So there's a lot of stuff. So the goal is first yeah. optimizing our training data. So once we have a lot more better training data and using your examples like rotating yeah. and things like that, uh, then at least once we get an accuracy of above 0.5, <laughs> then we can start tuning the hyperparameters. Because right now it's like very low simply right. because it's like the training data yeah. is very bad. The other thing yeah, we've noticed thing. was yeah. right now uh, with classifying points on the image. Right? Accuracy, we're obviously not going to be able to have the exact point, especially since we labeled those points manually by hand, and there's obviously a little bit of error. So we're trying. Sure. We might even try like calculating that error and see if the error is between a certain yeah. amount, and then using that to detect the image. Um, so basically, yeah, we just think our loss function might be flawed at this point. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did you guys talk about loss functions and stuff like that? Uh, we didn't talk, go into details about it, but okay. we're trying to use 10H and value to... Do activation. Yeah. yeah. Loss right now is just a uh, mean square, square error. Mean square error. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's just a basic one. It's we should probably function. work on getting a, maybe a better loss function <laughs> yeah. for if we're keeping this. Yeah. So loss... Yeah, I'll talk about this later if you want to. But yeah. 
Yeah, we're getting a little deep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just a little, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we absolutely would love to have your experience, both of you uh, and anybody else who. Wants Honestly, to talk any about of you, us. if you can be mentors to our software or even the build part of it, it'd be amazing. Because we need more people helping us with everything that we do, especially because we have four teams and we have all four teams. Right now, Mr. Ronnie is like I'm very, a cloud moving around. Pretty stretched thin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's a quick summary of everything that we've done. Open Steve, we all talked about the pros and cons. Doesn't have that wow factor, but we have a lot of experience with it. Uh, we're going to test it, continue testing out with it. TensorFlow Lite was uh, another version to use, uh, for example, ImageNet or uh, Inception. Uh, that those kind of models that we're also going to try out on the Android phone. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I'm Looking at your summary here, just one thing. I hope you're you're not throwing out OpenCV solution. At the worst, you want to use. At the worst, if you just want to play the game, is you use it as a confirmation of your other value. Yeah. Sure. All right. OpenCV is very good. The competition is like they said. The number one. The number one excuse is it worked at home. <laughs> and you get out there, and like you say, you have problems with lighting, that the lighting wax. Sometimes you have stage lighting in these, yeah, yeah. In these venues, and it just yeah. Yeah, it throws so you for a loop. Yeah. So, like, but so, like, with your neural that it just doesn't work. But with OpenCV, you can see why it didn't. Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of what I'm getting? Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. exactly what you're Because, yeah, you yeah. can't see so you got your box, and it's like, oh. But OpenCV, I can see, oh, it's goofing on the thresholding, or I need to turn this knob or that knob. So I'm gonna, that sounds like your winner there. For I'm going gonna, gonna to say that, that <laughs> OpenCV. I'm going to project it's 95% likely our final our, the, the, the solution that our we actually Our sister team got with. OpenCV working and they were able to score in the time. Yeah. yeah. So we we know we're comfortable with that. Yeah. This they're just following their interest here, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and it's and it's and it's fantastic stuff, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 If, if, you, if you got the bandwidth for it, you should be studying it, right? Yeah. And and you can always put a switch on it that says, okay, that failed. That's Go right. back to open yeah. right. yeah. Exactly. yeah, so we're doing yeah. parallel development, so we can have both yeah. those working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's the jobs thing too, because I mean, yeah, no, this is the future. <laughs> For career, right? yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's a hot area. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're off to a great job. start. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So, um, obviously, the TensorFlow stuff doesn't um, isn't as accurate, but how does it perform comparatively to OpenCV in terms of? Run time to compute. So, uh, in terms of the uh, version first gave us, it's performing fairly well. Like, it's able to detect it very easily. Uh, our sister team ran OpenCV and TensorFlow. The frame rate is. Yeah. Frame rate is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. So, yeah. in other words, you're gonna you're gonna do it. You're gonna use it while you're sitting still to analyze yeah. the the, the, so, the scene if you, if you like, uh, and then probably uh, um, you know. Use some other mechanism to decide to, to aim your robot and just go. Because it's pretty simple. You just got to disturb the mineral, right? You just got to knock in, knock into it, and they're pretty widely separated. So you don't have to have like real time tracking. Uh, so it's, if we had to do real time tracking, it wouldn't be so good. Yeah. So, so we could do we could do that with OpenCV. So the fine. TensorFlow is actually more compute intensive as well. Yes, yes definitely. So it's worse in every way. Yes. <laughs> right now. Right yes. now. Yes. Yes. Your training gets better, it can yeah. win out, but so right now. So you can't use, what's the little stick? It's the NVIDIA's uh, Fathom chip from Intel. Yeah. The yeah. same one that it powers might... the Google Vision AI? Google AI. We were not allowed any extra processors. Uh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what, what, you know, the processing that's on the robot, the that phone, is that's our limit. Like, there's one phone in the, and there's only, like only five different phones you can choose from. Yeah. So there's one phone that has a slightly higher uh, uh, yeah, the GPU, the GPU in it, um, and that, that's about, and it's not that big a, big a difference. Uh, yeah. Just from my from my can can collecting, uh -huh. uh, one of the most robust way I did it was, and you could use your your neural network for this. Is when you're sitting still and you look at it, you get your target, and you go towards it, right? But one kind of Key thing is, is when you get within say 12 inches of your target, you you stop, do one more final calculation, and grab it again, mm -hmm. and let. So all you need to do is use. I'm sure you've got distance things all over this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. You got to collect it, and then you move. <coughs> but make that extra step of of doing that final correction yeah. because if you don't, you might knock one of the yellow and one of the whites. 
Yeah, so what's happening right now is the camera, when we place it in the starting position, yeah. is barely wide enough to be able to see all three minerals. Um, so when, as we're pushing the mineral, we can only see one. So then at that point, we switch to a different pipeline, which would recognize that only that one image. Um, so yeah, that's where we're planning on going to. Does, does the phone have, um, okay, with its record pipe camera, they have what's called cartoon mode. It actually limits the number of colors that are output by the camera. Um, and I found it actually, you know, improved blob detection quite a bit with, you know, harsh lighting conditions. Like, you know, if you're, if you, uh, you know, whatever, calibrate or initialize it, you know, with bright light facing one way and shadows on the back side, um, you know, uh, like the pixie cam, in, in a lot of cases it, it wouldn't recognize the two colors on either side of the cam with the lighting conditions. And, um, but with cartoon mode it would, do you have something similar to that? Is it, is it just a... It's not in the camera itself, but it you can add it as a stage in the pipeline. Yeah. Oh, see, post, yeah. basically the posterizing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's another that filter we can add it to the image cool Threshold link, yeah. TV is, you don't have, no, it's not, it's just <coughs> yellow. Otherwise, yeah. it's not all various shades of yellow. It's just, it'll only, the camera will only have put yellow. Yeah, it's just yeah. very well, it's in the new camera. Out there, HS. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's still it's, it's, it's still it's delaying it. it that it's just it's by just, yeah. Right. yeah. So you can you yeah. can you can you can, you can do it in software. Yeah. 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 So there's like a lot of filters we can add in addition to the Open TV. Yeah. There's also ones that are built into the, the other MATLAB stuff. Yeah. They uh, what is what is new this year is that they've added support for external webcams. Uh, and so we like first plugged our first one in last night and haven't got to the point of being able to like really you know test it. So, um, but yeah, there's a USB bus in that system, and the only thing that you can connect to it aside from the phone and the control hardware is a USB camera. Um, and so you can get a pretty high, you know, higher quality, uh, you know, Logitech or something like that, and it might uh, might help out a little bit. You but the, yeah, the quality of the cameras on the phones are just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So what it what it really gives you is is a is a simpler way to sort of position your viewpoint, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's easier to put instead yeah. of putting the whole phone on a gimbal, you can put just a little webcam on the gimbal. And could you also play, you have like a wide angle camera and a Telephone. So there are no rules. Are, there are rules around. Uh, you cannot emit focused light, but you can focus on the input side. So yes, we've also got fisheye lenses and other things to play with. Uh, but yeah. you can do two cameras, right? Huh? One wide and one narrow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, so right now, you could technically have three cameras on the robot, right? We even talked about you have a mirror that, that pops the back, the, the, the back, back of the camera and, and pops it up more, right? So, and, and a mirror is a great, great way to add, you know, panning capability as well, mm -hmm. yeah, without moving the entire phone and how it's mounted to um, the robot. The other question I have is, have you, you looked at the object, the gold and silver objects in, like, infrared light? Does it look... Does one stand out? But you can't emit light. You mean, yeah. mean filter it? Filter it, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can emit infrared. You can you emit can. light, it can't be focused, and you can't use lasers. There's oh. a single, uh, oh, no, so no, Rev, no. Rev produces an optical distance sensor, which is time of flight, yeah. and it's only like 18 bucks. Um, and that that is the only allowed laser in the entire oh, TV right. competition. Yeah. yeah, I'd be curious if, if you know, the gold cubes, uh, Showed up, you know, in infrared light. In infrared, <laughs> yeah. Black, and the other one was white. Yeah, yeah. 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 that'd be the idea. Yeah. So far as the we have to test it. But there's a lot of other stuff around there too. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Look yeah. To <laughs> Sometimes it's what you can obviously test against. It, it helps, you know, just increase the rate of progress. It's uh -huh. harder to visualize what infrared would be like. And oh, you know, so oh yeah. Yeah. can you apply you any can... sprays to the cubes or anything? No, no. <laughs> we can't mess with yeah. <laughs> Those are official field elements, and they don't. The only ones that belong to us are the ones that we use for testing purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Sneak yeah. into the venue can't before. Take... Yeah, yeah, if one of you are, you can sneak in. <laughs> so at this point, uh, we're done with our side of the presentation, so we can accept further questions. Here's a few re references in terms of what we've done and also where we find stuff. Our, our website's a great place where you can look into all the machine learning stuff we've done so far. We try to document everything that we've done. And so the bottom thing you see, we've made, we've collected all
in blog posts and that one link. So if you go to ironrainrobotics.com slash tag slash vision, I think you need the slash index, that'll list every single vision post that we've made. Over uh, like four years. Uh, so, I only added the one to the list. Okay, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned earlier uh, different uh, viewpoints, different design ideas that come up, different structures for your robot. How do you all as a group decide which one to pursue? So the way we do it... Uh, Go ahead. Okay, so at the beginning of the season, basically, we come back, they do these things where they have the game reveal, you know, they take over the auditorium at a school somewhere, and they invite all the team, like, all the teams that are there to go check it out, um, and basically what we do, we see the game, and the second, but not even before leaving the place, we start just shouting ideas at each other, very, very, you know, politely. Um, and then we, we get back to the, the Verani house, which is our kind of base, home base, and that's where we then have the great robot debate that takes down every that takes place every year, uh, where we pull up the whiteboards and we start drawing our designs and keep you know telling them how each one. We kind of explain our ideas and, and go through and start nixing the ones that are going to be too uh, that just aren't as feasible. Yeah, okay. and uh, we we basically start crossing them off until we get down to just a couple, and then we start the great build where the whoever likes their idea more tries to start building their robot or at least a, a similar <laughs> idea of it, right? And right? then. Whichever one of that we we wait like we get about two weeks to do that, and then whichever one we like more, then then like see this one this is Minimax this is the one we started working on and uh, like uh, to go against this one that one got next because right now it's not in the place it needs to be. Although later we have a, a plan going forward to incorporate that into our next kind of robot design as um, more. They've got a completely crazy design. That's not related to this. Not at all. It has nothing to do with this. This is what I'll be doing instead of Christmas this year. <laughs> so, uh, um, there was something different that happened this year with the actual robot design. So this summer we took part of a chassis design project, which essentially our multiple teams across the Dallas area got together to research different chassis before the um, before the competition was even released. Like we were just like, what chassis works best for what? So obviously we did a mechanical chassis last year, like a large mechanical chassis. And we we're like, what are the benefits of that? Here's some drawbacks, here's some pros, here's some cons. Uh, we actually designed big wheel during that chassis project. We hadn't really even thought about doing like a two-wheeled robot before, but I think it was just kind of like, let's try it, let's see where the pros were, the cons. We didn't actually think this would be our competition robot. Um, we, I didn't think. <laughs> this is a mini mechanical chassis because we want to see where the pros and cons of having um, a mini mech, and then we just designed Big Wheel for fun this summer. And we actually said there were a lot of pros of using uh, a chassis like Big Wheel, so then we decided to go forward it during the season. And that this was what a mechanical chassis has to look like. So it can do forward, sideways, and rotation. It's basically a six directional mini mech. Yeah, it works better on foam tiles, which is what the yeah. entire competition has done on top of. They have extra grip. Yeah. And now I'm going to see if I break it or not, but... Oh no. Did we bring any cubes? No. no. Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> but... So that hasn't been tuned since competition. You can run the video for it. So, it picks up stuff from the ground, which is its true objective. That's cool. Uh, it's it's around. I just want you all to see the inside here because I'm really proud of this. Yeah. And you can look at the wiring too and more of how the connections work. So, y'all can. Feel free to come down around. Well, I guess I'll do it. Why don't we put it on the big wheel? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, these two chains are basically held on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Explain your baby. The, the idea of uh, having this is. Basically, last year the two big designs were these flipper robots and there were gripper robots. And we said we like both of them. Then we combined them both into this. Which, uh, if you'll turn around uh, the robot right here, you see you have a little, little gripper. It goes in and out. Yeah, basically it intakes blocks and it has an internal lift in here that moves it to the top. Uh, and there's there's physics behind that. We didn't uh, we didn't bring them, but there were yeah. like six inch foam cubes that were the game element last year. Okay. You could only have two of them under control at a time. So they built a stackable uh, way to grab them to intake them, um, and then automatically lift them up to stack them. Yes. And then and the idea is 
this is not, again, this is tuned wrong. I think one of the chains is slightly off. But, uh, I can? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so basically the idea is this, no, I can't, because it's got oh. the verbal oh, yeah. oh, yeah. no, it's, like, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Anyways, basically this flips up into the high position right here, which allows us to score on top of the two blocks, because basically you're allowed to have four block stacks. And since this is one, that's two blocks, once we flip it up on top of itself, that's four blocks in a stack. So this is roughly six inches. <laughs> <laughs> oh, roughly. okay. Roughly. And you can see how this conveyor belt works, where it just all these no. Kinda. Just when I roll up video. I told you to do it. Yeah, we have a little, we have a video demonstrating everything on the robot because there's like a tradition in FTC where if you like us every top tier team makes a little robot reveal video and it's like a little gimmicky thing everybody does. Uh, but basically the idea here is that there's the the way this all works is because there's these two Beautiful little uh, 3D printed parts here that have slots for uh, these these chains. So the idea is that as it, the robot goes on a curve, since the by the radius it basically it changes and the angle on these becomes farther apart. So it goes so it kind of comes out and locks into place. These are called attachment links, right yeah. there, mm -hmm. right? So oh, it's nice. a special kind of chain link, and this is number 35 chain, so it's beefier than the 25 that they normally use. Um, this is 25. But, um, yes. Yeah, these are 25 links of the drive system. Um, but for this one, these are attachment links, so they stick up, uh, and then we put bolts through them. And so as they go around the curve, they spread apart, and then they and then they lock into the tabs on these three yes. printed parts. Uh, and so that thing is just floating on top, and it either locks into the back set or the front set. Oh, okay, set. Uh, it went up. So depending on sort of, it goes yeah. up and not at an angle usually. Yeah. Usually it's it's much. The chains haven't been tuned, that. so yeah. Yeah, it's not calibrated at all. Let's we'll uh, see the review. We'll see the review. Yeah, show you the review. Of it, yeah. But you see, it also has like an LED light strip on top, and we actually change the angle of the camera from the computer vision. So. Go ahead. Oh, my bad. Spoilers. <laughs> we like to showcase our design process too a little bit. So. <laughs> so that's early in the season. It looks very different. <laughs> something that really from a distance unless you, you really appreciate it it doesn't look very like yeah, it like makes it look a lot cooler when you got some shaky cam in it and some music in the background no. yeah but this is what a world's robot looks like I guess uh, <laughs> <laughs> very, very early season and this is what the kind of stuff that we hope to have by the end of the year 
So obviously this season it has to stay much more compact because it's up on that uh, yeah. up on the lander and, and you keep it light. And but, it's, but it's got a lot of evolution. Part of, part, of part of this, that, and the reason, okay, so we want to, it'll cut down on weight too, which is we want to make this one lower, just to have a low profile so it can go actually underneath the lander, which is something a lot of robots that are, you know, big, square, bulky, like this one is pushing 18 by 18 by 18 on every single boundary. Um, we want this one to stay, you know, a good six, seven inches below 18, so. Oh, uh, hate to break it. <laughs> We're like an eighteenth of an inch under. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we usually cut it by 132. For we usually there. have to cut it. Like, no, please, just try one more time. I swear. Like, I went for sizing at Worlds for this like five times before they approved it, so. <laughs> and that was, that basically consisted of him going to the sizing cube and coming back to me and then saying, shoot, we gotta remove something. <laughs> <laughs> file it down on one edge, and then we basically, every year, they just, it's like a piece of paper is yeah. the distance between our robot and the side Not of the even, wall. It's like even less than that or something. <laughs> <laughs> but we make it every time. It and it'll be available to Yeah. <laughs> so if That's you don't want to... pretty much it. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to drive this around, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Any daring volunteers? <laughs> okay. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. 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 How much time did we take up? Uh, like two hours. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's yeah, two o'clock. Oh my god. Okay, now this time, smile. <laughs> okay, one more.